So if we continue the series on vows, we have do not be rash is the next thing, which is a reference to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 2. But the point being that a vow is a serious thing and that a vow um, is a word that is spoken to God. And the thing that we have to learn today, I guess, is that everything we say is a vow, in a sense. Everything we say is something that is supposed to be good and clean and true. So all of it should be governed by the Lord in this way. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2 says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. And there's something about this, I think, for prayers, that uh, our prayers ought to also, to be characterized this way, do not be rash with the mouth. Do not let the heart be hasty to utter a word before God. Uh, as well as the controlling idea that God is in heaven and you are on earth. Let your words be few. There's a respect, uh, there's a fear associated with that that is useful for prayer, both public and private, I think. But if we look at it as what it really is, that we have boldness to enter the throne room of grace by the Son of God, well, we ought to treat it in a, in a way that is respectful and that honors God. And this idea of don't be rash, don't be hasty, that's truthful. We, we're not really intended to be improvising, if you will. <laughs> we should think about what it is that we're saying to God and, and um, think about what it is that we're asking for from God and what we're thanking him for. But that respect idea of God is in heaven and you are on earth, let your words be few. Uh, that's good. We, we have to remember that God knows everything. We don't need to tell him. <laughs> um, you know, he knows what his word says. Uh, he knows what assails us, you know. So we ask for what we need and we pray for those whom we love and, and for those who are in need and, and we be, and we be done. Um, so that we give him an appropriate respect, so that we do a good job of what we're saying. But he's also talking about taking a vow, that if you're going to take a vow on earth for God, well, you make sure that you do so not hastily. Make sure that your words are few. Don't bind yourself in something very complicated that might have ramifications you don't understand. If you're going to do this, it needs to be simple. There's also Proverbs 20, uh, verse 25, which is a very important one. Proverbs 20, 25 says, It is a snare to say rashly, it is holy, and to reflect only after making vows. It's a snare, uh, not a drum, but a trap. <laughs> it's a trap to say rashly, it is holy and to reflect only after making vows. Which is to say, you don't lay hands on something and call it good before you actually know whether it's good. <laughs> it should be a little more, um, I guess, if we're thinking about the dogs, you know, less like the golden retriever and more like the Sheltie. <laughs> the Sheltie is a shepherd. It's a little standoffish. Not necessarily mad, but he's going to wait and see if you're cool or not. The golden, you know, immediately shows the thief where all the treats are, um, you know, so that he can be a good boy and get one. Um, you know, we should be more like the shepherd, <laughs> more like the, the shell team. Just, you know, give it, you know, be sure that you're sure first. That's all. But the snare, the snare to say rashly it is holy, you know, and there is that idea, this permissive idea that you see sometimes with brethren that, you know, it, there's no real questions about what somebody believes or, you know, where they're from or why they left. Um, 
when they come to be a member uh, or if they say that they're a Christian. And there's, you know, a lot of things can be done on the quick without really looking into it. And that's the idea. This, as a Christian, you know, to live the life of God, we should be investigating. We should be looking at things before we jump in there and commit to them. We need to know whether or not it's really the thing that we ought to be doing. Which is not to say that you walk around paranoid or that you suspect everybody of evil. That's not it. We're just saying you need to know before you do it. Um, you know, I remember somebody going around work saying, hey, you know, give to this, you know, or buy this thing, which is fine. But, you know, it all, you know, all the proceeds go to charity, so that's great, you know. And I thought, well, what charity? <laughs> and what does that charity do with that money? Where does it go? You know, not to be a jerk, although people think you're a jerk if you start asking questions when you're told that it's going to charity. But really, you do kind of need to know, what are you giving money to? Where is that going? What's being done with that? Because you're empowering it. You're laying hands to it. It's a snare to call it holy and to reflect only after you're committed. That's the idea. So... You don't commit to something that you don't understand fully or that you don't have all the details about. That's all we're getting at. Do not be rash with the mouth. Again, is pointing at the importance of what we say and what we lay our hands to. That when we do so, that endorsement is binding. That means something when a Christian says it, or it should. It should mean something. Um, the other thing is Leviticus 22. The, the other, I guess, the next idea is that even though they're making an offering, voluntary offering, it has to be perfect to be acceptable before God. It's voluntary. It's being offered. <laughs> you know, and people think, well, that's good. Uh, you know, you chose to do it and you chose to give them this thing. And, you know, God shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. That's kind of a mistake. What the law actually says is Leviticus 22, for example, 18 to 22, when any one of the house of Israel or of the resident aliens in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering for any of their vows or free will offerings that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish of the bulls or the sheep or the goats. You shall not offer anything that has a blemish for it will not be acceptable for you. And when anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering from the herd of the flock to be accepted, it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. Animals that are blind or disabled or mutilated or have a discharge or an itch or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. Well, this is true that their offerings were being eaten by the priests, and the priests and, and their families were fed by the offerings that the people brought. And if the people are bringing things that are blind, disabled, mutilated, have a discharge, itches or scabs, that's not something that you want to eat. What are you putting into the bodies of those who are serving on your behalf? Um, besides that, what God has said already, that you know this is not a, a suitable thing to be giving to God. But you know, when you think about it in terms of, well, would you eat it? Would you accept this? Would you take this? Well, that makes that raises the bar, doesn't it? That makes the standard a lot higher. But the Lord is saying free will offerings, you know, vow fulfillments, which are free will, whatever it is that you give, he said, to be accepted, it must be perfect. And yeah, like I say, people have this idea that it, it, you know, if you're volunteering, then, you know, whatever it is, is good. And that's the, the little drummer boy, you know, 
that idea of, well, I chose to give you this thing, and so you're going to take this thing. But that's not really true. <laughs> you can't do that. God accepts what he asks for and not anything else. You can volunteer to give a voluntary offering or to, to make a vow, to fulfill a vow, to give an offering, a free will offering in fulfillment of a vow. You can do this, but it still has to be done God's way. It still has to be something he will accept. It still has to be perfect because God always has to have the best. His respect is the first thing in any offering. Uh, the other place would be, for example, Deuteronomy 23. Um, at verses 17 and 18, there's this idea introduced of contamination, <laughs> commingling. Deuteronomy 23, 17 and 18. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. None of the sons of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow. Both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Well, that's interesting. You say, well, it's only money. No, it's ill-gotten gain. If there, there is a fee, if somebody is performing uh, fornication for a price as some kind of a cult prostitute, which was a common thing in the ancient world, you know, as he said, that you don't bring that money in here. We that That's not good for the Lord. The Lord does not accept that kind of ill-gotten gain. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to understand, that we also have to be concerned about the source of a thing. If you're going to quote it, if you're going to uh, use it as a reference, if you're going to recommend it to others, if you're uh, going to offer it to the Lord in service, and you, you need to know where did this come from? What, it, what does it mean? Does it have a meaning besides the one that I'm intending? You know, you got to know something about the source. Understand where did this come from? And is it uh, contaminating in some way? Is it making a connection that shouldn't be made? Um, or implying approval or endorsement that should not be? Uh, that has to be thought about when you're doing something, if you're giving. Again, people might say, well, you're giving. And it's money, and isn't your money, you know, the money doesn't mean anything. Well, but it does, because you know where it came from. You know how it was gotten. And that can't be used to serve the Lord. We cannot do evil that good may come of it. So, yeah, I, you know, you can probably get crazy with that, and we're not talking about craziness. But there's a pretty big difference between, you know, the company I work for does some things that it shouldn't do. And I made this money by selling my body. Those are pretty different. Even though people's political rhetoric, uh, you know, is hyperbolic and makes those equivalent, they're not. There's a pretty clear difference between money you got by selling drugs and money you got working for a company that makes things that sometimes people use for evil. Uh, no, I don't think you should work for a company that only makes evil. <laughs> don't work for Playboy magazine, right? There's nothing good that they do. But the fee of the prostitute, the wage of the dog, and that's what it means by dog, the male cult prostitute. And you can figure out the rest of that on your own, I'm sure. Malachi 1 is the other thing that we talk about with, uh, you know, with regard to this idea that it has to be perfect. Malachi 1, 13 to 14, the priests say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or what is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished instead. 
for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Right, they're bringing stuff that's not the right thing. They are saying this is a weariness to serve the Lord. You know, there is that temptation that you're thinking, well, the reason why we don't investigate everything or the reason why we don't ask questions, you know, it gets tiring. You're always having to check things out. But, you know, that's the truth of being a Christian. You are a priest. You know, we are priests and kings before the Lord. We offer the sacrifice of right living to him. You know, Romans 12 talks about present your bodies a living and acceptable sacrifice to God. Um, priests are always making a distinction between the clean and the unclean. That's their job. The people come to them and they decide whether this is clean or unclean. Can you do this or can you not do this? Is this acceptable or is this not acceptable? And they know what the rules or the law of the Lord is and they impose that. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what we do as Christians. We know what's right before God and God governs our every move. He governs what we do and what we say and what we lay our hands to to do and work. We can't snort and say, what a weariness. You bring what has been taken by violence, what's lame, what's sick. Taken by violence is very similar to what we read before, gotten by prostitution. Uh, taken by violence, again, this is a sinful means. It's ill-gotten gain. And that shouldn't have anything to do with God. God doesn't want it. He doesn't need money. We need to give. He doesn't need to receive. <laughs> what is lame, what is sick you bring, we can't expect God to accept that. But then there are cheats too. He said that he has a male in the flock, he vows it. But when it comes time to sacrifice, the animal that shows up is not the one that he vowed. It's a different animal. In fact, it's a blemished one. Not only is it not the one that he said it was going to be, it's not even an acceptable one. That's what happens sometimes. People make a vow or they make a promise or they, they say, I'm going to serve God. But then when the going gets tough, they compromise the truth. That's promising something that you could have done, be faithful to God, and offering something else instead that's blemished, something that's less than. And that's not okay. God's not going to accept it. All right, finally, let's look at oaths. Matthew 5 is one such place, and Matthew 23 is another, and James 5 is the last one. But Matthew 5 first, about oaths. Now, oaths are similar to vows because they're also made out of words, and they're also things that you're binding yourself to do. In Matthew 5, 33 down to 37, Jesus said again, you've heard it said, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Matthew's uh, record of Jesus' teaching, having come down from the mount to the plain, as Moses came down from Sinai with the law, is that you don't, you know, they used to say, don't swear falsely, perform what you have sworn, which is like a vow. But Jesus said, look, you don't need to be taking oaths because there's nothing you can swear by. <laughs> Heaven is God's throne, not ours. Earth is God's footstool. Even earth isn't ours. The city, the holy city of God, Jerusalem, is the city of the great king. And that would be for us the church. Not even your own head, because you can't change one hair, white or black. And some will say, but I have children that can change my hair white. <laughs> and that might be true. <laughs> but you can't cause it to happen. It just happens. You're not in control of that either. But don't take an oath by your own head. You can't make one hair white or black. It's true. You, you can't change yourself. 
or your stature and some, you know, you can't cause anything to happen. It's not even possible for you to swear. And the meaning of this is not that you can't, you know, raise your right hand and in an oath, in a ceremony, or in a court of law. The point of this is, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Meaning, when you as a Christian say it, it's true. That's all. That The reason why you don't take an oath is because you're always under oath. You're continually under oath from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Everything you say is required to be right and true and good. It's not like, oh, you can just say whatever you want, unless you're giving an oath, and then it has to be the truth. You know? Now I'm telling the truth. I'm finished with lies. Believe me. Okay, that was a lie. But now I'm telling the truth. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. You know better than that. Now, as a Christian, it should be what you say is simple, yes or no. You are honest with your answer and straightforward. But the things that you put forth, they are true. Anything more than this comes from evil, meaning you, you can't be shifty, you can't be hiding, you can't be trying to get people with the small print. <laughs> Matthew 23, uh, just verse 21, or 20, 21 and 22 of Matthew 23, Jesus said, whoever swears by the altar is swearing by the altar and everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple swears by the temple and by the one who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by the God who sits on it. Just to make clear the, the magnitude of what you're doing, if you try to make an oath or you try to swear, you know, when it comes to backing things up, Look at the magnitude of this. You can't just swear by the altar saying, well, you know, there's this thing over there and it's in the city and we all know it and love it. It's a nice landmark. No. <laughs> Everything on that altar, meaning the offering, the sacrifice to God, it is a holy thing. It's a significant, if you will, cosmic thing. And the temple and the one who dwells in it, well, that's not what you meant, right? Right? By heaven, well, that's the throne of God. But if you're swearing by the throne of God, you're swearing by the God who sits in that throne too. And you sure can't change God. God doesn't change. So you can't, you can't swear by that. God can swear by himself. As Hebrews records for us, there's nothing greater. <laughs> but we cannot, we don't have the power to change those things. They're not ours. We can't modify them. We can't call them as witnesses, if you will. It just can't be done. So you understand the meaning of this when it comes to do not be rash and vows. We're saying understand too what is in your control and what is not in your control. What you can promise and what you cannot promise. That's also important. And the reason Jesus said this is you don't have to worry about those things if you just be honest all the time. Then you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to think about how am I going to back this up? You don't have to back it up. It's true. Just say what's true and you don't have to worry about it. And finally, James chapter 5 Verse 12, he said, Above all, brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So James saying above all, meaning control how you are thinking and doing, because I think it was very common for them to swear by heaven or by the temple or by whatever else, you know. Um, and we all... Are, you know, these are all familiar if you uh, think back to like quaint old English shows. You know, people say, by Jove, I think he's got it, you know. <laughs> and of course, Jove is Roman, so they thought it was safe to swear by a fake Roman god. <laughs> they would say, by Jove. <laughs> uh, but there are other things that people used to say. Um, and 
that's a whole different story, I guess. But if you look at Shakespeare and the places where they said, by this or by that, those are swears too. And um, that's where you begin to come up with our modern idea of swearing as cursing or cussing, bad words. Uh, that's where they came from. I know there's, it's very popular, for example, to say zounds or zounds. People usually say zounds because it looks like sounds, but with a Z. But they don't realize uh, that that is from Shakespeare and it comes from by his wounds, which is not a nice thing to swear by at all. It's not a clean word or a meaningless word at all. It's a pretty loaded, nasty thing to say, actually. And Shakespeare does that sometimes. <laughs> but it's another of those by formulations. I think in James 5, those who were in Jerusalem and its environs were accustomed to, to doing this, to swearing by heaven or by the throne or by the altar they were accustomed to making their promises or their assurances this way. And uh, so he was being plain with them that you have to, you have to stop doing that. They're, those things don't belong to you. They're not in your control. Um, let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. Condemnation being the judgment. There's going to be a judgment. And we will give answer for what we say and what we do. He said you can fall under condemnation if you're using these kinds of oaths. These are things you don't have control over. You're not treating what is holy as holy. You're speaking rashly about something that you really can't deliver. Let yes be yes and no be no. Be truthful. That's how you do this. People don't have to press you to tell them the truth. They don't have to press you to get the real deal. Uh, be straight with me now. Now tell me how it really is. You know, okay, okay, you got me. No, that doesn't happen to a Christian. <laughs> I just told you. That's the truth. That way you don't fall under condemnation. So this is the meaning uh, for vows and, and do not be rash. This is what uh, really I think all of these things are part of Ecclesiastes 5.2. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let the heart be hasty to utter a word before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. I think that sums everything up very nicely. Um, we as the children of God must be honest with ourselves and with others. We must speak what is true and be simple, yes and no. We also must know what it is that we are affirming. The trick about let your yes be yes and your no be no is that you have to know yes or no. You, you must already have arrived at is this clean or is this unclean. You have to make the judgment and then you have to say it. So that comes from conviction. That comes from knowledge and investigation, um, asking some questions ahead of time, understanding it before you approve of it, before you endorse it. That's when you can have your yes be yes and your no be no. I remember well, and I'll leave you with this vignette, but I remember well, yeah, it's too bad. This uh, fella that was an elder of the church years ago, but anyway, he wanted, he really, really wanted to bring this false teacher to the congregation uh, this man that taught error about evolution and creation and the age of the earth. Um, it was Shane Scott that he wanted to bring. And so, you know, I, I just asked him, like, have you even taught to Shane Scott? Do you know that he teaches this error? And, and he said to me, oh, I asked him if he taught that. And he said, no. I thought, oh, this is not good. We have an elder who does not investigate, who lays hands hastily and is rash with the vow, making inquiry only afterward. Now, this is not good. And it wasn't. He turned out, this is not here, so somewhere else, but he turned out to be a real problem. A lot of bad things happened after that. 
but um, I think about that in regard to this, you know, that sometimes people are just not willing to ask because they don't really want to know the answer. They don't want, they want, they don't want to have to make distinctions. It becomes a weariness, They're tired of, you know, holding the line for God. So I would encourage you to remember that God is going to reward us very soon. Don't grow weary in doing good. We're heaven bound. Uh, God is simple in that he is merciful and he's on a rescue mission. He wants us to be saved. So don't be rash. Um, don't be too concerned about, you know, earthly ties. God is going to repay us and the time is soon. Well, today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian that you might have forgiveness of sins. We are ready to help you to be baptized in Christ's name, which is something of a vow, a promise to be faithful to God from then on. If you are already a Christian, you have that vow that you are to discharge, to be faithful to him. If you haven't, you've got to repent, make things right with him. We will pray with you if you desire, because all of us are also tempted and we try to strengthen each other. The church is supposed to be a resource to help one another on to heaven. If we can pray for you, if you have a spiritual need in that way, or if you need to obey the gospel, please let your need be known by coming to the front now while we stand and sing the song selected.